One of the most incredible religious places you can visit, located right in the heart of downtown Columbus, Ohio, is the Museum of Catholic Art and History, which has been recognized by the Vatican as the largest collection of diversified Catholic art in the United States of America. Hi, I'm Father Daniel Bowen, Vocation Director of the Mercedarian Friars here in Columbus, Ohio. And we're going to take a look at the Catholic Museum of Art and History. So let's take a look and see. We'll get a little tour and get a sense of the beauty of our Catholic faith here in this wonderful and very often uh, noticed, we'll have to change it, leave this video, uh, museum. Good morning. Good Welcome morning. to the Museum of Catholic Art and History here in Columbus, Ohio. My name is Brian and I am your tour guide today. The museum was established in the year 2000 as part of the Jubilee year. Since then, we've moved from our, our location at that time to our current location on Broad Street here. We're right across from the cathedral and located in, near the offices of the Catholic Foundation. What we'd like to show you today is a little bit of our collection. If you follow me, you can see what we have here in this site is about 10% of our entire collection. We moved from a larger site into this site right now, so we're rotating items in and out. The first thing I'd like to show you is our relics. We have over 300 relics here out on display. These are generally first-class relics. A first-class relic is an actual bone, tooth fragment, or hair of a saint or blessed, one who has been officially declared a saint within the church. Catholics do not worship these items. These are part of our history in reminding us that the saints were real human beings. Here you will see them in, mounted in cases and objects called reliquies. These are to protect the relic for its safety so that it doesn't deteriorate or get damaged. Many of these relics come from old churches that have been torn down. They've been donated by priests, families, and other individuals who are willing to preserve this part of the history. Here, within these relics, some of our most famous saints are included. You'll find a relic containing the bones of 12 apostles that is located here in what appears to be an old watch case. We have the twelve less Judas and they added Paul, Saint Paul, to become the twelfth person in that reliquy. All right. Okay. Over here we have a small display honoring the different members of women's religious orders. We have some of the sisters who have served in the Columbus area. These sisters provided for nurses and hospitals, education of children. They also provided support for the poor, the orphaned, and those who are just discouraged. Without the sisters' contribution here in Columbus would be a far poorer place. As you can see, these are habits that were generally of the 1800s to the, through the 1900s. Most sisters' religious orders today were habits that are simpler and less complex. The fabrics may be newer. Um, they don't have the elaborate veils as they used to. This is much more common today with a simpler veil. The ones that actually are pressed, there's a machine that does that pressing to create that crepe-like pattern on that sunburst that's on her head. Um, it's a pretty crazy looking machine and kind of scary. Mm. So I wouldn't want to be working with one of them. Many of the habits um, were designed also for durability, to keep them warm. Some of them were designed to keep things clean and sanitary when they served as nurses. Um, if you see, the hair was all pulled back, so they wouldn't necessarily um, have issues with that. 
Before I also get too far, you're more than welcome to take as many pictures as you like. That's our best form of advertising. <laughs> <laughs> so with the sisters, we also have a collection of saints relics. The sisters here are representing um, saints who have started religious orders. As you know, Catholics, we don't worship these items. They're bones or teeth or hair that remind us of that person. Early Christians used to hold their mass in the catacombs of Rome, so we became adapted to having these items. Many churches have them located in the altars or mounted somewhere in their church as part of a remembrance of the saint that that church might be named after. So we have over 300 out on display right now. I'm doing a research project to um, dig up and find all the information we can about these saints to create a better display other than just case, something more modern, interactive. So this is a cool little piece only because it's history. It was in a Catholic hospital that was to- uh, closed and torn down. One of the construction workers tried to salvage some of the pieces out of that so they just weren't smashed and destroyed with the rest of the building. He kept this in his garage for about 25, 30 years. Um, this piece is just a plaster statue, but he's really taken by the beauty of it. He brought it in. I was here when we unloaded it off the truck. And what was kind of cool was we set it down over there and we were getting ready to move it to the back where we could start working on touching up the paint. There's nothing historic that we would um, ruin by touching up the paint. One of our volunteers said, oh my gosh, that's the most beautiful statue I've seen. And so they erected this gazebo and brought the flowers. Um, the family's connected to a um, florist. And they set that up right away, so we never got the chance to take it to the back. Um, they're going to be taking this down shortly, and we'll be moving it to the back to get us working. Moving another piece in here. We have all kinds of artwork. Some of them were done by professionals. Some of them, we don't have any information on who the artist was. This one's kind of neat because if you come up close, you can actually see the grid lines that were on the canvas Mm -hmm. so that an artist would be able to position things the way you want it. You can also see the pencil lines where they had sketched out the scene before they painted over it. Uh, Don't have much information on this one at all. What's interesting is it seems to be a not a real professional doing it, but the quality is amazing. And the framing is elaborate. Very. So somebody really cared about that particular piece. Mm-hmm. We have a variety of different items that include statues and illustrated manuscripts. These are illustrated, oops, that was good. These are illustrated pages from a prayer book or a song book. You may have heard mm-hmm. that Bibles were handwritten by monks. It took a monk 20, monk 20 years to produce a whole Bible. It was incredibly valuable. They also had illustrated artwork decorating it. Um, these are probably from the late Middle Ages and relate to, like I said, different prayer books. We unfortunately can't afford a whole illustrated Bible. We'd love to have someone donate <laughs> one to us, but those are very rare to find. These are examples of stained glass windows that we've reclaimed and are in the process of having them reframed and eventually we're going to do some neat work with them. Many of them come in the state of the one behind here. If you look carefully, you can kind of see that. That's how we get them. Stained glass windows are made with leaded glass and there's lead solder um, in between the glass pieces. So a lot of people today don't want to work with it because of that. But we'll have them cleaned, we'll have them protected and sealed. We have some paint that needs to be cleaned up off of this one. Um, This is in fairly good condition and it's St. Raphael. We're going to have it mounted in a way that this will be lit up from behind with a whole set of LED lights to kind of simulate the sun going through and you'll be able to see the real color. Luckily today we have more sun. In the, yeah, in the afternoon, the sun's setting that way, so you get much more light through these. Um, they're, they're just gorgeous. This one, um, the bottom is restored. That's the top portion that's got to be remounted there. This one is Jesus with little children. There are cracks that will be need to seal up, but it's great. Um, a lot of churches um, can't afford to have stained glass windows today, and many of them are having them torn out because they can't afford to maintain it. Oh, that's a cool piece you've identified. Yeah, that's cool. This is from Alfred Tibor. He was a concentration camp survivor. Uh 
We had a display of an old Jewish synagogue, and he was so touched by it, him being Jewish, he donated some of his artwork to us. Wow. He was a local Columbus artist who's died since then, and his family's continuing to support us. I'm hoping we can get a whole exhibit made just for him. Too? These They're are two of his really bronzes. Yeah. Here, here, and that bronze over there. They show the faceless rabbi, and it's a rabbi who's kind of anonymous, just serving his duties and not being identified in a particular way. We have one carrying their Torah, their scrolls of scriptures. This one is proclaiming it. And these are in a particular prayer ceremony where they're holding their prayer shawls over their heads. We also have three Tibor um, pieces that are of biblical works over there. Yeah. What's really amazing is the faces, um, the anguish that's on Abraham here as he's going to sacrifice Isaac, um, Moses' anger at seeing the Israelites below him uh, worshiping the golden calf, and this is Cain and Abel. Mm. Cain's depicted with a mouth that's open. Mm. Abel's mouth is closed, and that's because Abel doesn't say anything in the Bible. Mm -hmm. Mo, uh, Cain actually has a conversation with God. So that's a neat little item that the artist put in here. Also the hollowness of the eyes and kind of that anger in his face. It's really cool. We have some other Jewish artifacts that were getting put up on display. One of which here is the Ark of their Covenant right now. This is an old, old structure. It's a cabinet that would hold the scrolls. This has to be repaired and reattached. This has to be repaired if we decide to do that. What's great about this one is it's not from a synagogue. It's from a prison chapel. Oh, wow. The prison's no longer here. They tore it down, but we acquired this um, from some Jewish patrons. It's okay, St. Casimir will be fine. <laughs> we also have some of the artifacts of the Jewish faith. We recognize Jesus was born a Jew. The horns were used by the rabbis for the call to prayer, some of their prayer books, menorah at Hanukkah, and even some dreidel that the children would play, and that one would be lucky then, that person mm -hmm. having a symbol. We have also the replica of the Ark of the Covenant. I like telling visitors that I can touch it, so it's obviously a replica, because if it was the real one, I'd be dead. Um, this is about a third to a half size replica. That's not near size. No, but it's so cool because the real one would have been made of acacia wood and covered in gold leaf. These would have been cast in gold, the two cherubim, and it would have contained three objects, the Ten Commandments on their tablets, the showbread, um, and man, you made from the manna, and then also the rod of Aaron, indicating that he would be the high priest. So this is also neat because they divided up duties in the tribe of Levi. Different clans had different responsibilities. There was one part who their job was maintaining the poles and carrying the ark. As long as they carried the ark, everything was fine. They put the ark on an ox cart or somebody else tried to carry it. That's when things went wrong. So it's really kind of cool. Like the kids like seeing this. And myself being a fan of the Indiana Jones movies, I love, I love seeing I also have one article from Pope John Paul II, a book that he autographed, um, one of the many books that he wrote. Um, he was actually a university professor, a priest, playwright, poet. And he had so many jobs that he, he performed before he actually became a, a bishop and later a cardinal. This is a case containing some two-dimensional artworks, some of which are called icons. These are popular in the Eastern Catholic, Catholic Church, also in the Orthodox. Yes, that's a very famous painting image that we have Mary with the child, Jesus. These are examples of icons that more than likely would have been in Orthodox or Eastern Catholic churches. They're wood painted and they would have had um, covered with silver or brass or even some of the ones that we don't have in gold. Oh, you're fine. <laughs> they um, have some figures that they would be worshiping. I'm sorry, not worshiping. They would be re 
regarded as saints. This is Saint Helena. She's a saint in the Catholic Church and Orthodox Church. She's the one who is uh, believed to have found the true cross. Her son was Constantine, the emperor. He reunited with the Roman Empire and then moved his capital to a little seaport town called Byzantium, and then he named it after himself, Constantinople, which today is Istanbul. In the Orthodox community, he's considered a saint. In Catholic, he's considered very important, but not a saint, and it has to do with when he became baptized in a Christian, was on his deathbed. But um, some of these are just paintings in a Western style. This is a beautiful one of the Holy Family that I truly like. This one here, this is of the Holy Family. It's called a triptych because it's made of three sides. The outside are meant to close and cover the inner picture and protect the those pictures so it could be folded up and then opened up to be put on display in a home. Um, I used to have one. Um, unfortunately, it wasn't worth very much, and my students destroyed it because they kept opening it and closing yeah. it and broke the hinges. These are high school kids. <laughs> they got to touch and see everything. We have three stained glass windows here. These, along with two paintings on that wall, came from St. Vincent's Orphanage here in Columbus. It's located on Main Street. The large stained glass windows were made in Germany and imported here. The two largest paintings on that wall were painted, of, uh, they're copies of originals that were in, kept in Europe, but they imported those just to put into uh, an orphanage wanting to help lift up the children in a way. St. Vincent's was a boy orphanage. Boys orphanage, we have uh, Jesus meeting the little children, Jesus impressing the scribes in the temple at age 12 with the story from Luke, and this is the Annunciation. If you look carefully, you can see that this is actually green glass, but the artist who makes these paints the details on. Mm. They don't have the colored glass for the brown hair and then the face. It's all one piece of glass, and they'll paint that. A lot of details will come when we actually have lights mounted behind to see the blue of her dress and different red here of the vase and the white flowers. There's purple on the pillar. It's really kind of amazing colors. This is um, this mannequin has Cardinal um, Moody. He was a cardinal in Detroit. He had ties to the Columbus area. He was very fond of us. And when he died, uh, we obtained some of his clothing. We have his normal cardinal wear that he would wear in the 50s and 60s. And here, this is made of fur. This is a crucifix that he would wear. And it was quite elaborate. This was his everyday um, wear for that time. They were much more elaborate. Cardinal Mooney also wanted his shoes to match the liturgical season. So when he was saying Mass, and he was saying a Mass during Advent or Latin, he had these shoes. He would also have the red for Pentecost and Saints, um, we were Saints Feast Days, Saints who were martyrs, green was ordinary time. The black was everyday use of funeral. What about pink? What about rose? didn't have rose, and maybe because they didn't really use rose as often back then as they may have done a darker purple. Mm -hmm. Today we use more of a rose color in Advent, um, definitely. So this is our temporary display of bishops who were in Columbus. It starts with John Carroll, who was bishop of the entire United States just prior to um, the Revolutionary War period. And it goes on further to some of the um, items that the bishops actually had in war. This is part of a tea set from Bishop Rosecrans. He served as bishop of both Columbus and Cincinnati at different times. We have some of the items from more recent bishops, including Bishop Griffin, who was here to 2004, Bishop Reedy, who we have a high school named after him now. He died or was bishop to 1957. And this is all we have of our most current bishop, <laughs> Bishop Earl Fernandez. You're going to get um, talking to him. <laughs> yeah, he is a neat person. His mass is still on, installation mass is still on YouTube or from oh, EWTN. Cool. Mm -hmm. He was installed um, May 31st. Yeah. He's an Ohio guy, so we're really lucky. He, um, he's descendant of Indian 
his Indian parents who immigrated to the United States. So he's a first generation. Nice. Um, it's also cool in that he went to the University of Toledo, Ohio State. He was in the Archdiocese of Cincinnati. So we're very lucky. He's familiar with us. He's also very young and enthusiastic with lots of energy, <laughs> which uh, great. blows me away. They come from the Holy Land. We obtained these from a museum that was in Washington, D.C. that closed and we were able to obtain some of their items. They represent first, second, and first, second, and third century things that everyday people would have had. Um, these are pipes that they would have smoked using the tobacco. These tiny little discs, those, excuse me, are copper coins. If you remember the story from the Gospels about the widow who dropped her two copper coins, those are real copper coins in the size. The gold pieces were much larger, closer to our quarter, um, and so were the silver denarii. We have a uh, second century Roman spear tip that would be similar to the type that the Roman centurion would have used to stab Jesus, and some clay pots, um, clay items. This is actually an ancient glass bottle. Mm -hmm. Glass was very rare, but it was available in the Roman Empire to the wealthiest of people. So that would have contained some type of precious oil. This is one of the paintings that's being restored from St. Vincent's Orphanage. Sadly, today's Thursday. On Friday's day, our artist comes in and does the work. You can see um, what he's done so far. He loves questions, he loves talking to people, and loves showing kids what he's doing. He's worked with Murphy's Oil Soap, Toothbrush Water, and he's cleaning this entire painting first. This spot right here, and he's going to leave. That was the color of the sky before he got started. Oh, wow. There's a lot of soot on here, a lot of dust, and a lot of dirt. He's going to leave it so we can point it out what he did since then. He's also been replacing the tears. He's got most of the holes and tears covered up, patched. He, this one is about a foot long. There's two over there. There's a hole that's been patched. Eventually he'll come in, sand, and he'll start painting to fill in the rest. Mm -hmm. To show how good Dave's work is, there is another foot long tear. That one was here. Oh, wow. You can kind of see a little bit different texture there, but that's um, the quality of what Dave is doing here. The frames are out with different artists right now being restored. They're made of wood and plaster. These two cases come from one family who collected religious figures. Um, this family came from Columbus. Many of these are from Spanish colonial era. They're called Santos. And they're delicately carved wood. Some of them would be more of the German kind of style of wood carving. The ones in here, in this case, also show the color and detail of the painting and the texture. We had a couple pieces just come in last week that we're evaluating before we put them on display. This one here is really important. That's from St. John the Evangelist. It was painted by um, a student of Michelangelo. I'm sorry, oh, wow. painted and carved by a student of Michelangelo. We also have here a collection of old Bibles, some in the case that are too delicate to have out. We have two replicas of early Bibles. These you're allowed to touch, flip through. Um, they're not um, in a condition where it's salvageable, so we keep them out. The kids love to touch them and other guests like to touch it. We have a Bible here. This one is 1778. And this one is a Bible in German. This is a Catholic Bible here um, that's the Vulgate. That's the translation that St. Jerome, Jerome made. This one is from 1705. You can see the cover has already fallen off. And this one is in Latin. We have an Anglican Bible from the Church of England. And this is really neat because the first part of it is their Book of Common Prayer and their sacraments. And we're going through this. This is from 1678. And it's basically an instruction manual for how to run their local Anglican church with all of their prayers and their liturgies, this portion. And this would be their Bible with the King James Version of English that's translated. 
We have an old commentary here that would have been um, used by theologians, bishops, priests. This one is in Latin, and this is just on a series of the prophets. There's a whole series of books that also go with this collection, and we have some of them out right now. Behind you is some of our other Bibles. This is a replica King James, and it was the same print style, the same type of pages. They're almost like a linen fabric. It was built to last. Um, the new binding is modern binding because the old bindings wouldn't last very long. But a leather, real leather cover. And this was made on the 40, 400th anniversary of the King James Bible being issued. We like keeping it out because it is in Old English. We just have to teach people a little bit about how to read it. <laughs> the S's um, almost look like F's. Yeah. for the first S's. So this one says, looks like Iophias, it's actually Josias, um, who would have been Josiah, the Jewish king of Judea, here. We have some works that come from Lutheran church. Luther was instrumental in getting the language changed to the vernacular or local language for him in German. So we recognize his contributions. This one piece is really cool. It's undated. We don't have a lot of info on it. But it's from the Coptic mm. Church. This was in Ethiopia. We have an mm. Ethiopian Orthodox Church here in Columbus mm. that I really want to get um, in touch with so that they can take a look at that and see what they might be able to help with that. We have some old Bibles here and old prayer books. This one is an authorized um, 1600 mm. book with a newer cover to preserve it. The pages are very fragile. This one is from 1654. It's an old book of the saints. Here is, this is the Ditto Bible. It's likely the first Catholic Bible that came to the state of Ohio. The Ditto family obtained it in 1808. It's from the late 1700s. The Ditto family still has descendants that live in the Columbus era, area, and they donated that to us. It's really precious to us. This is a new piece we just pulled out and I'm trying to gain more information. Uh, Mademoiselle Gilliard was a French woman who obtained a printing company through, um, the, once her husband died, she inherited it. Had she been Protestant or living in Protestant communities, she would have not received the company. It would have been given to, her, uh, to his nearest male relative. She took it and then brought in more printing presses. She's one of the first to have multiple printing presses operating. This Gilliard Bible was from the mid-1500s, and she seems to be a really um, important person in the early printing industry, because this is only coming about 100 years after the Gutenberg Bible was first published. So I'd love to get a look at it and do the research. Um, the, to get an original, it's going to cost us at least $25 million. Yeah, We obviously easy. don't have that. Um, this is neat. It's cost us um, $10,000 to obtain this when we purchased it. What's nice about this is it shows how Gutenberg did the text, but then hired artists mm -hmm. to paint it. It's the only book that Gutenberg ever printed because it was the most difficult task he had. Um, the pages don't have chapters and verses. So if you drop them, there's no page numbers, there's no chapters and verses. It would have been a mess. Chapters and verses were added to Bibles shortly afterward to help printers keep track of where yeah. they were in the printing stage. This is our first edition Roman Catholic New Testament. This is printed in 1582. It's the Reims edition. Dewey was the Old Testament, Reims was the New Testament, and that translation is available for Still free available. Yep. For inter on the internet. Mm -hmm. So budding yep. entrepreneurs and writers can use that edition for free. Yep. <laughs> Don't have to pay fees. We have a book here that was um, inscribed to a family dedicated by Padre Pio. We mm -hmm. have his autograph in there. And this is a prayer book of St. John Vianney that he would have used as part of his prayers. We have some rocks here that come from the pathway outside of the house of um, Padre Pio. Um, a very kind person brought those to us. Please don't do that. <laughs> we don't want people stealing stuff from these sites. Right. We still have them. Here's a collection of more modern artwork and um, more recent artwork. We have some works that are in ivory. 
Today, of course, we can't use ivory as an art form. We're allowed to keep these. We haven't destroyed them because of their historical nature and also to demonstrate that these were also hinged and inside would have different stories. People used all this artwork to tell stories. They just didn't use it because a lot of people were illiterate and this would be the best way to communicate to those individuals. Here we have what's known as micro mosaics. There's a school in Rome that still teaches this art of using the tiniest of stones. It, doesn't, it looks like it's painted from a distance. You have to get really close to see the actual stonework. This is neat because this actually has a pelican image with Christ. Like the fish, the pelican is an early image used by Christians because the story of the pelican is that if a mother pelican couldn't find fish for her um, chicks to eat, she would tear off feathers to cause her chest to bleed and the blood then would revive them. And the symbolism is because Christ then is like offering his blood to revive us to new life. What's interesting is this pelican is in a crucified position behind Christ. That's yeah. like a Louisiana State flag. Oh, I'm yep. Doing that. I had two mm-hmm. guests from Louisiana mm-hmm. um, last Saturday who were so excited to see the pelican here. Mm-hmm. They were taking lots of photos of that. This is more modern artwork. Um, there's a group of artists who come from the Holy Land. Most people don't realize that cities like Bethlehem used to be 90% Christian. Um, today, they're 2%. Many of the people came overseas. Um, here, um, they establish families. What they do is they sell artwork. They would carve this and sell these all in markets in uh, Jerusalem, but now they sell them. They often go to different parishes. I imagine yours may have seen them. Yeah, I have a few small pieces, but they're really quite expensive. A manger scene, mm-hmm. I saw it cost like $3,000, yep. which I don't have. We <laughs> just have a... I'm sorry? We bought our nativity there. Oh, it's mm-hmm. amazing. Yeah, um, I have some small icons and some tiny crucifixes that I bought to decorate my classroom when I was a teacher. Uh, it just shows more modern art here. We have a collection of different crucifixes. We also have our pieces that are believed to be from the True Cross and from the True Crown of Thorns. We do have paperwork from the Vatican with this, but again, it's not a matter of faith for salvation. It's a matter of faith should you choose to believe this. The church doesn't require belief in that. But they're the tiniest little wood fragments that are kept in these two um, reliquies. This crucifix would have what's believed to be part of the crown of thorns. Over here, these are called cross tokens. When St. Helena found the cross, um, they believe she only found about 20%. Much of it was destroyed or ruined. When the cross pieces were rotting out, what they would do is they burn them, mix the ashes with clay to create these button-like tokens. <laughs> so people could carry it with them, but it also was very unobtrusive. If somebody's robbing a person, they're going to look at that and think, oh, they're not really important. Um, the gold and silver coins they want, hopefully they would leave those behind. This crucifix here comes from the first Catholic church in Kentucky. It was donated by a French king who donated it to the priests who were establishing that in Bardstown, Kentucky. It's at least 400 years old, so it was old for the time period. We're not going to be able to restore it. Um, experts have looked at it and said it's not going to make sense to have restored. In fact, this condition is better for it at this point. We preserve it, but we aren't going to restore it to its original shape. Part of the head was cut off, most likely because of the log that it came on. They probably didn't have enough wood there, and so they had to cut and add another piece to it. And that piece fell off at some point in its history. We've actually had to cut a hole in the ceiling tile to fit the whole cross in here. So we're very lucky to have this. We also have some others to compare it to. This is a cross from Africa that was used as a procession cross for the beginning of their masses. And what it displays is showing Jesus in traditional African artwork. He's elongated and emaciated. His facial features are African. This is acceptable in the church for people and artists to depict Jesus as he would appear locally. We have a Japanese artist who displays Jesus with Asian features. If you're familiar with Our Lady of Guadalupe, she looks like the natives of Mexico at that time period with the darker skin and the darker hair. We have here an Orthodox cross, which is different from the Catholic in several ways. 
there's always have three cross beams, one of which for the sign that would be above Jesus' head. This one is for the cross beam for his arms. This one was for a cross beam that where they believe his feet were attached. Their tradition is that his feet were mounted on, on uh, a board rather than nailed to the cross in this way because that doesn't appear capable of supporting a body. A person who dies on the cross is suffocated because their upper body would press on their diaphragm, preventing it from expanding. Other thing features about it is they always show Jesus in repose in a face of serenity to demonstrate how he willingly accepted the cross. He also is in no pain. He has no blood depicted on him. There's no wounds on him except for the holes where he was pierced in his hands and his feet. These represent the artistry that used to be in um, Eucharistic um, chalices, monstrances, ciborium, and they reflect the artistry that was put in to offer something beautiful to display God and Jesus in the form of the Holy Eucharist. There's elaborate artwork, there's stones mounted in here, there's um, engraving that's of the finest detail. We also have inlaid stones, and it's really neat. We have some that are actually part of the Orthodox tradition. They receive Eucharist with a host. Their Eucharist is a loaf that the priest has scored on the top, and it's cut with a knife as part of their liturgy. The cubes are then dropped into a chalice so that the wine is infused into the bread. They pick it up with one of the spoons, and if they're modern priests and very talented, they can flip it onto the person's tongue. I've never done that. Never done that. <laughs> You've seen the oh, video of the old tradition where they would stick it in the person's mouth and they would take it in. Yeah. Um, today, they're very good with that post-COVID. Um, when I lived in Dallas, Texas for 25 years, St. Basil the Great, um, Byzantine Catholic Church, the priest was really good at flipping um, onto the tongue. We have a really interesting set of pieces. These are Stations of the Cross from a church in Germany. They're actually painted on metal, not wood, which is unusual, but they also were part of the church. That, it was bombed during World War II. They salvaged as much as they could, and some of the items that were salvaged were at these stations here. And you can see some of the damage that they still had. Right now, you're lucky because we have a temporary display up. This is of our salute to uh, military, uh, military chaplains and Catholics and other uh, religious figures who served in World War I to the Korean War. Um, this was put up for Veterans Day and, um, and Memorial Day. So we're going to put leave it up for about another month and then we're going to be taking it down. We haven't decided what to move in here. This will be kind of a temporary space. We mm -hmm. rotate things in out. These are pieces that belong to Monsignor Feistel. He was born in the early 1900s, ordained a priest in the late 1930s. After World War II, he enlisted in the army to serve as a chaplain. He wanted to be with the soldiers in the field. He did not want to serve stateside. So he joined the 101st Airborne. <laughs> if you've seen Band of Brothers, um, you, that's the 82nd Airborne. You can see the rigorous physical training. He had to complete all that same training. He had to make all the parachute jumps before going over. Um, he had to make all the physical requirements. Um, he's not in the photo, but this is Eisenhower on June 5th meeting with the paratroopers who were going to paratroop into France that night on June 6th. Monsignor Feistel uh, was one of them. He parachuted into France, served with the 101st Airborne all throughout Europe. He was present at the Battle of the Bulge, um, ministering to soldiers there. After the war, he came back, um, served as a parish priest here in Columbus. Korean War came. He wanted to rejoin the military. They said, you're a little older now. He said, nope, I want to be with the 101st Airborne. He had to requalify with all the physical requirements and all the jumps. He eventually did. Then sir, came back, served as a parish priest um, until 1980. He was 68 then. He decided his life's not over, so he became a missionary priest in the Philippines, where he was assigned a parish in the Philippines, came back and did serve as a priest in his retirement, died in 2005. This was a tough guy, um, amazing individual. These, some of these are wartime pieces. Um, the ones we have out, these are from his local parish um, life that he had and some of the stuff that he did take um, when he was serving overseas. Often, though, 
the chaplains had to have much smaller kits. This is an example of one from the 80s, 1990s era, a little bit later. This is green um, army. It contains all of the items, all of the instructions for um, the priest. It contained plastic bottles for the water and the wine had a tube which contained the hosts before they were consecrated. He has a paten, he has his um, chalice, which is not in here at the moment, but it also has candles. They would have set it up wherever they could. Um, often you see depicted on a Jeep, truck hood, picnic table. We have some pictures of how they served throughout the years wow. um, during different wars. This would have been a cross that would have been from a chapel. They also could have taken with them. It would have been very rare to have this in the field, but it's very heavy and tended not to knock over easily. He has a prayer book that would have been issued to Catholic servicemen. My grandfather had a set of these. Um, I don't know what the condition was. My uncle attained it when my grandfather died. I have a tiny, tiny little statue of St. Joseph that he carried with him in World mm -hmm. War II in a little metal case that appeared someone just machined it out of something. Um, so I don't have a lot of his items. We do have some World War I items. This is actually a complete uh, chaplain's kit for a Jewish rabbi mm -hmm. serving in the field. It contains their cup, their candles needed, the prayer book, a prayer shawl. Um, it contains their Ark of the Covenant, which they would have had their Torah in scrolls here. All of this fits in sides, protected, closes up, the covers come off, wrapped up in here. And this looks like a small black briefcase hmm. that they would carry their work in the field. This is more modern. This is Father Schwartz. He serves in the Marine Corps right now. Presently, he's in Guam. He has served several tours in Iraq and in Afghanistan. My understanding is he was one of the last groups, part of the last groups coming out of Afghanistan last year. He brought some of his kits for us. This is his um, desert camo outfit. What's kind of interesting is that he's an incredibly skinny individual. Our male mannequins <laughs> wouldn't work. We actually have a female mannequin because it was thin enough for us to get that on. He did bring some of his kits in and has talked about using them. They're much smaller than mm -hmm. the kits there. This is the woodland um, jungle camo that they used. He has um, a really neat chalice and saborum that they would unscrew and then fold back up and screw like this to take up less space, come back up. I think I'd be better at this after a month of doing this. <laughs> Here. He has the lid that would be placed mm -hmm. on it, but the lid also comes off. He has this in order to carry the host during the mass. You would put the cover on like this, flip it up with his thumb, then take the host out, close it with his thumb so they wouldn't get dust and dirt till the next person came up for communion. Mm -hmm. Then after they were used, he could put the consecrated hosts away or consume them so they wouldn't be just left around, and then put the lid back on here with the chalice. He performs his purifications and be ready for his next um, service. It contains his stole that he would wear over his camos when he's out in the field in order to pro uh, provide sacraments of reconciliation to soldiers in the field. This, I believe, is his woodland camo version. Priests are targets. The camo isn't just a decoration. Um, they had to wear that because just wearing all white would make them a target in the field. Um, in many countries, shooting a priest is considered to be an important honor. So he has some of his gear also that he's brought in. And this is actually part of the priest's vestments. We have a few other items that come from individuals who've served as well. This is a saborum that was used at the Battle of, Get Betty, Battle of Gettysburg. Many of the soldiers there were Irish, pre, uh, Irish because they um, took the job in the military because it provided food, clothing, a steady income, and they were able to then um, use it for their families. 
Also, with the rudimentary um, draft that they had just established then, wealthy people would pay someone to take the role for them and serve in the military. They even had so many Irish individuals, they formed Irish companies, Irish battalions. They wanted their priests there. So the Battle of Gettysburg was actually a three-day battle um, in which there was movement back and forth and different sides, incredibly bloody, um, but they would have offered mass and other sacraments to those individuals, which had to be very comforting for those going into battle. Incredibly brutal. Um, people don't realize it wasn't very neat. Many of the people who were injured, um, they died in the field because the surgery procedures were very simple and not very helpful. They didn't understand sanitation completely. Uh, so people died of infections, um, either post-surgery or from the wounds themselves, particularly if it was an abdominal shot. It was almost 100% fatal. Um, it was very sad. So We have a couple pieces here that I wanted to show you. And that's about the bulk of it. <laughs> Can you tell me about this organ? It's from a funeral parlor in Wisconsin. And uh, again, in the 1920s, it was not uncommon for funeral homes to have pipe organs. The theaters had them to accompany movies. Churches had them to accompany large congregations. And if you're wealthy, you have one of your residents. So all the big mansions of the world, uh, the Ringling Brothers Mansion in Sarasota, Henry Ford Mansion, uh, the Biltmore Estates, they all had pipe organs. Um, and then most of those organs also had role players. So if you didn't have an organist available at the funeral home or at the, the mansion, you put the role in, like a player piano would have played the organ. Um, this is just part of one of the mechanisms. Each pipe has a little leather pouch under it that collapses, allowing the air to go in. You can actually demonstrate it this way. <laughs> so um, very mechanical instruments. Um, and again, this is a small little pipe organ. It has three sets of pipes on it, a flute, a string, and a vox humana, which is Latin, your Latin lesson today, vox humana, human voice. And that one needs tuned. So the organ also has a set of chimes on it as well. So, But again, funeral homes everywhere had these instruments, and sadly, pipe organs are going to the dumpster. Like I said, funny. So, um, so again, we were able to save this instrument, a, a great benefactor of ours. I've sent this down to us, and uh, it gets used uh, a lot. <laughs> so, but a great little organ. Great. So, okay, that's an overview of some of the collection.